What does Revelation chapter 12, verse 17 tell us about the Godhead and the great controversy and the issues at the end of time? Keep watching to find out. Hi, thank you for joining me today. We're going to be looking at some of the claims that people are making right now in regards to what the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy actually say about the Godhead or the Trinity. I understand that this is a controversial topic. It is a uh, topic of debate in uh, a number of churches and it is causing people to leave the church. It is splitting churches and so it's an important topic and it's also a very sensitive one. I have friends that uh, see things differently than what I'll be sharing here. So nothing is being shared uh, to attack individual people, but we do need to make sure that we are standing on Bible truth. And so before we go any further, let's uh, stop and ask God in prayer to guide us and lead us. Heavenly Father, as we open your word, as we look at your inspired writings, I ask that you would give us discernment, please give us wisdom, Please give us understanding so that we can make sure that we are not being blown by winds of doctrine. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So the title here of our study today is The Godhead and the Great Controversy. And we're going to be looking at Revelation chapter 12, verse 17 to begin with. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ you'll see that I have highlighted three parts of this verse. The first part is the word remnant. The second is the phrase commandments of God. And the third thing that is highlighted is the phrase testimony of Jesus Christ. We're going to be looking at this verse in reference to the Godhead controversy today. And there are three ways in which the devil would love to get any of God's people off track from truth. One is by causing us to doubt the Word of God or the commandments of God. The second is by doubting the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation 19 verse 10 tells us that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So the second way that the devil would love to get us off track from truth is through um, misusing or misunderstanding the spirit of prophecy. And then the third way is in our understanding of history. It's important for us to remember that the remnant church of Revelation doesn't just appear out of thin air with no historical context. Revelation 12, 17 is the last verse in that chapter, and that chapter is a, an amazing line of prophecy that tracks the church of God down through uh, both the Old Testament, through the time of Jesus, through the New Testament centuries of persecution, um, all the way down to the very end of time. And so the remnant that is brought into focus in Revelation 12, verse 17 is rooted in history. And this is important because today in our broader culture, we see a great attack on, on history. We call it cancel culture, right? And that's part of it. Um, this rewriting of history. And if there's something that I don't like or I don't agree with, then that's okay. We'll just rewrite the history books and we'll change the history. What happens when we do that? When, when history is forgotten or rewritten and lies are accepted in place of truth, then we forget why we're here, we forget who we are as a people, we forget what our mission is. Uh, Seventh-day Adventists are rooted in history. We are rooted in prophecy. This is a prophetic movement. We have a prophetic mission. We are moving toward a prophetic point in history. It's called the Second Coming of Jesus Christ. And the devil would love to get us confused on our history as well. So these are the three areas of attack. Satan will attack the remnant on their understanding and use of the Bible. Satan will attack the remnant on their understanding and use of the spirit of prophecy. And Satan will attack the remnant on their understanding and use of history. Now we're going to look at all three of these in reference to the Godhead controversy in an effort to better understand what the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy are really trying to tell us on this issue. So let's start with the issue of the Bible. How do we understand and use the Bible? We're going to look at four principles and here they are. Number one, all scripture is inspired by God. 
Number two, Bible passages must be interpreted in their proper context. Number three, later prophets interpret earlier statements in Scripture. And number four, the Bible is the standard of truth and error. If we can keep these four principles in place in our study of the Bible, we will be in a much better position to discern uh, truth from error. So let's start with number one. All Scripture is inspired by God. 2 Timothy 3 verses 16 and 17 tell us this, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Now the Bible is a big book. Uh, if you've ever tried to read all the way through it, perhaps you have wondered, why did God have to include so much in the Bible? But this verse tells us why. Every word of Scripture is important because this verse tells us all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is God's message to humanity. Now, what does He intend it to do for us? The passage tells us it is profitable for doctrine. That's teachings, right? So it helps us understand what is truth. It is profitable for reproof and correction. So it also reveals what is not true. It reveals what is error. It's profitable for instruction in righteousness. If we want to, uh, well, we need the truth, we need the data and the facts to sink below our head down into our heart and to affect how we live life each day. That's instruction in righteousness, practical godliness. All of Scripture is needed for this. What is God's goal? That the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. God has given us the promise that we can be perfect in Him through faith, and then that will be expressed in a life lived in good works. All of Scripture is important. So here's the first claim that is being made on websites, uh, books and articles. There are lots of videos out there. One of these claims that you'll see is this. The Bible's clearest statements regarding a triune Godhead are spurious. Now, we'll look at a couple of, or we'll look at one in particular of those Bible verses in just a moment. But we're going to start with a statement from Spirit of Prophecy. This is from Ellen White, letter 22 in the year 1889. When men venture to criticize the Word of God, they venture on sacred holy ground and had better fear and tremble and hide their wisdom as foolishness. God sets no man to pronounce judgment on His Word, selecting some things as inspired and discrediting others as uninspired. The testimonies have been treated in the same way, but God is not in this. Now, you'll see as we go through our study today that many of the things that apply to the Bible also apply to spirit of prophecy. And uh, she makes that clear here in this last sentence. The testimonies have been treated in the same way, but, the, but God is not in this. In other words, God is not leading people to start dissecting the Word of God or the spirit of prophecy and saying, well, this verse doesn't belong, or this passage is questionable, or this idea probably wasn't in the original. We are warned that when we begin to criticize the Word of God and place our opinion or our thoughts or our scholarship above the Word of God, we are venturing on very, very dangerous ground. Um, God sets no man to pronounce judgment on His Word, selecting some things as inspired and then discrediting other things as uninspired. Now, one of the verses in the New Testament that is very clear about a three-person Godhead is 1 John 5, verse 7. I'm going to turn there, we'll read that verse, and then we'll um, continue. 1 John 5, verse 7 says this, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. It's a pretty clear passage. And many people um, are making the claim that this verse really does not belong in the Bible because it's not in some of the manuscripts. Uh, the earliest manuscripts, uh, many are saying, that the Bible is drawn from. Now, it's interesting and important that when we look at the Bibles that the Waldenses used, we find that 1 John 5 verse 7 is included in the Waldensian Bibles. Now, who were the Waldensians? The Waldensians were Bible-believing Christians during the Middle Ages, that were heavily persecuted for centuries because of their 
faith in the Word of God and their um, refusal to acknowledge the authority of Rome. And when we look at the Bibles that the Waldenses used, we find again that this verse, 1 John 5 verse 7, was included in many of their Bibles. It was in the Old Latin Bible that was used by Bible believers in Europe. It was in the Romant or Akaten New Testaments used by the Waldenses dating back to the 12th century. It was in the Tepel, which is an old German translation used by Waldenses from the 14th through the 15th centuries. Now, why does that matter? Why is it significant that 1 John 5 verse 7 was included in the Waldensian scriptures? Well, it's significant because we are told in the book Great Controversy that the Waldenses had the truth unadulterated. Great Controversy, page 65, says this, The Waldenses were among the first of the peoples of Europe to obtain a translation of the Holy Scriptures. Hundreds of years before the Reformation, they possessed the Bible in manuscript in their native tongue. They had the truth unadulterated, and this rendered them the special objects of hatred and persecution. Now, to have the truth unadulterated means that they had the Scriptures in their purity, that there were no erroneous or false texts um, or, or Scriptures that had crept their way in that would pull them away from a pure and true and biblical faith in God. A similar passage in the same book, Great Controversy, page 97, tells us this. The Gospel had been planted in Bohemia as early as the 9th century. The Bible was translated and public worship was conducted in the language of the people. Many of the Waldenses and Albigenses, driven by persecution from their homes in France and Italy, came to Bohemia. Though they dared not teach openly, they labored zealously in secret. Thus, the true faith was preserved from century to century. This is important because many people are making the claim today that if we believe in a three-member Godhead or a three-person trinity, that we have given up the true faith and that we need to uh, discard those teachings or that idea in order to return to the true faith. But we are told here in an inspired writing, the book Great Controversy, that the Waldenses had the true faith, that it was preserved from century to century in their sacred scriptures, and those scriptures included 1 John 5 verse 7, which clearly identifies the Father, the Word or the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and that these three are one. Let's look now at the second biblical principle that uh, we need to keep in mind, and that is how important it is to interpret the Bible in context. Jesus said in John 5 verse 39, Search the scriptures, for in them you think that you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. What was Jesus saying? He was telling the Jews and the leaders of his time that as they read the scriptures, which was the Old Testament, uh, that they needed to realize and recognize that all of scripture pointed and predicted Jesus Christ the Messiah. If they failed to recognize Jesus in Scripture, they were missing the point of Scripture and they would uh, inevitably misinterpret Scripture, which is exactly what they ended up doing. One of the big reasons that Jesus was rejected by the Jews of his time is because he didn't match their idea, their conception of what the Messiah should be. They wanted and an earthly military commander type person that would free them from the Roman rulers, they weren't looking for a Messiah who would save them from sin. So they were not reading scripture in context. As a result, they rejected the truth and the person, Jesus Christ. So let's apply this principle now to our topic at hand, which is the Godhead. Many are claiming that Proverbs chapter 8 reveals a created origin of the Son of God. In Proverbs chapter 8, verse 22, we read this, The Lord possessed me in the beginning of His way before His works of old. And the me here is wisdom speaking in a personified sense. So, before we go further in Proverbs chapter 8, we're going to go to a passage in the spirit of prophecy. This is uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 34. It's very early in the book. This passage is often referred to by those that believe Proverbs chapter 8 reveals um, the origin of the Son of God. At some point in the distant past, uh, those that believe He was uh, created or had a beginning separate from the Father will often point to this chapter. 
And they will also point to this chapter in uh, Patriarchs and Prophets. So let's read what Ellen Wright writes. The sovereign of the universe was not alone in his work of beneficence. He had an associate, a co-worker who could appreciate his purposes and could share his joy in giving happiness to created beings. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Christ the Word, the only begotten of God, was one with the Eternal Father, one in nature, in character, in purpose, the only being that could enter into all the counsels and purposes of God. Now I'll finish the statement in just a moment, but notice here that in this paragraph, uh, Ellen White is trying to draw a a comparison between God the Father and God the Son. She is trying to show how they are similar, how they are united together. She says it very clearly. They are one in nature, in character, in purpose. Uh, that will become important. Her, her intent for this paragraph becomes very important as we continue looking at this topic. Now, reading on. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, his goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. And the Son of God declares concerning Himself, and now she's going to quote from Proverbs 8, The Lord possessed me in the beginning of His way, before His works of old. I was set up from everlasting. When He appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by Him, as one brought up with Him, and I was daily His delight, rejoicing always before Him. So at the end of this paragraph, Ellen White does quote from Proverbs chapter 8 in reference to the Son of God. So, was she endorsing the use of Proverbs 8 to explain the origin of the Son of God? Now, if you're only listening to this study, uh, you won't see the ellipsis, but in her quotation from Proverbs chapter 8, there is an ellipsis in the original. So these are verses that she left out. When she begins quoting from Proverbs chapter 8, she begins in verse 22. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of His way before His works of old. And then she quotes from the first part of verse 23. I was set up from everlasting. And then the ellipsis occurs. And again, this is in the original. These are verses that she chose to not quote in Proverbs, uh, Pat uh, Patriarchs and Prophets chapter 34. She picks it up again several verses later. When he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him, as one brought up with him. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. So we can draw some important points from what we have just read. Number one, Ellen White does identify Proverbs 8 as a reference to the Son of God. It is uh, admittedly uh, metaphorical in nature. It uh, uses personification to refer, but she does use Proverbs 8 to refer to Jesus Christ, the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. She also only quotes from four verses, as we were just saying. Those are verses 22, 23, and then 29 and 30. And she only quotes those portions of the verses that clearly identify the eternal existence of the Son. Ellen White does not quote from verses 24 or 25, the two verses that are most commonly used to argue for a non-eternal origin of Christ somewhere in the distant past. Now let me read for you verses 24 and 25. When there were no depths, I was brought forth, when there were no fountains abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. And that phrase, those two words, brought forth, that's repeated twice in verses 24 and 25, are the verses that are most commonly looked at, or the words that are most commonly looked at to suggest that Proverbs chapter 8 is revealing the origin, a created origin, of the Son of God. Ellen White leaves those two verses out. In this paragraph, Ellen White also quotes from Isaiah 9 verse 6, which refers to the Son of God as the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and she quotes from Micah 5 verse 2, which states that Christ's goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. These verses clearly highlight the similarity of the Son with the Father and the existence of the Son from everlasting. So, what does this tell us? The intent of this paragraph is to reveal the unity and similarity between the Father and the Son, not their differences. Again, quoting from her, Christ, the Word, the only begotten of God, was one with the Eternal Father, 
one in nature, in character, in purpose, the only being that could enter into all the counsels and purposes of God. That is the purpose, that is the intent of patriarchs and prophets, page 34, is to show the unity and the similarity and the everlasting nature of the Son of God. It is misguided at best, it is disingenuous at worst, to use a passage designed to show the unity between the Father and the Son and to try to use that passage to show the difference between the Father and the Son. It's uh, inaccurate at best, it is misleading or uh, dishonest at worst to use a passage designed to show the everlasting nature of the Son to say, look, here is a passage that is showing the uh, a created origin of the Son of God. But that's not all. We have to recognize that wisdom in Proverbs chapter 8 is used uh, metaphorically, it is used in personification, right? We find wisdom speaking. Uh, clearly, wisdom is not an entity that can speak unless you're using a literary figure like personification. So, let me make my point here. Proverbs 8 speaks of wisdom metaphorically and applies wisdom in a personified sense to the Son of God. If this chapter is to be taken as a literal historical revelation of the Son's origins, then what would we make of verses 1, 2, and 4 which identify wisdom in the feminine gender? So Proverbs 8 verse 1 says, Doth not wisdom cry, and understanding put forth her voice? Verse 2 says, She standeth in the top of high places in the way, in the places of the paths. Again, if chapter 8 of Proverbs is intended to uh, be literally understood as a historical origin of the, of the Son of God, then we really need to read the entire chapter that way to keep the context of the chapter the same. Is this saying that the Son of God is actually a she? You can see the problems that we run into. Now in verse 3, wisdom crieth at the gates, at the entry of the city. Would this mean that Jesus only calls people at the city gates? In verse 4, wisdom calls to men and to the sons of men. Is Jesus only calling males to salvation? So, what if I'm, I'm a man but I'm not at the city gate? Does that mean that Jesus isn't trying to save me? Or if I'm a woman and even if I am at the city gate but I'm not a man, then is Jesus not calling me? You can see the problems that we run into if we uh, misuse the literary intent of Proverbs chapter 8. It is a metaphor. It does use wisdom as personification, but we cannot take it literally to explain the origin of the Son of God. Now, a third principle of Bible study that we are looking at is that later prophets interpret earlier prophets, or later prophets interpret Scripture for us. Peter wrote in 2 Peter 1 verse 20, no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. This means that I am not at liberty and you are not at liberty to open up the Bible, pull out a verse or a passage or a line of prophecy and say, this is what I think it means. We have to allow the Bible to explain and interpret itself. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 32 says, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. So how does God help us to understand the Bible? It's really not through impressions. It's not through the ideas that might pop into our own mind. It's really through the Bible itself. If we want to understand the Bible better, then study more of the Bible. If you want to understand the spirit of prophecy better, then study more of the spirit of prophecy. Now here's a claim um, that will tie into this principle of Bible study. Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 states that God is one and thus negates the possibility of a triune Godhead. This is one of the most common verses and passages that is referred to by those that uh, reject a three-person Godhead or the idea of a trinity. Let's read Deuteronomy 6 verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Now, this verse does say in English that uh, God is one Lord. But the original Hebrew word that is translated as one uh, literally means a compound unity. It is a Hebrew word that is used frequently in the Old Testament to refer to the idea of a collection of people or things that is united together in such a way that the, the collective is referred to as one. So it's a compound unity. There is another Hebrew word that uh, 
always literally means one thing, one person, one object. But that is not the Hebrew word that is used here. It is the Hebrew word uh, that refers to a compound unity. Now, we need to allow the Bible to interpret itself. We need to allow a later prophet to interpret what Moses wrote. So, Jesus is going to do that for us in John 10 verse 30. Jesus interpreted Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 in John 10 verse 30 when He said, I and my Father are one. So, Jesus is saying the same thing as Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 and He's clearly identifying Himself and the Father together as being one. It's the idea of a compound unity. Now, let's take it one step further. Ellen White, a much later prophet, interpreted John 10 verse 30 in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 430. Here's what she wrote. Christ, the Word, the only begotten of God, was one with the Eternal Father, one in nature, one in character, one in purpose, the only being that could enter into all the counsels and purposes of God. So Jesus made it clear in John 10 verse 30 that He and His Father are united together. They form one. They are one God. And Ellen White further explains what that means in the passage we just read. They are one in nature, in character, and in purpose. If we allow the Bible to interpret itself, if we allow the spirit of prophecy to uh, exemplify those same principles, we can be kept from um, making unwarranted conclusions based on uh, our personal reading of individual passages. Now, we're going to move to the second major section of our study, and that is how we understand and use the spirit of prophecy. Many of the things we've looked at in our study of the Bible are going to apply as well to our study of the spirit of prophecy. But um, here's a claim that is often being made, frequently being made right now, about the Godhead issue. Here's the claim. Ellen White indicated that certain Bible passages about a triune Godhead cannot be trusted. So the following statement from Ellen White is frequently cited to support the idea that some of the Bible's clearest passages cannot be trusted about uh, a Godhead. Now here's the statement. This is from Early Writings, page 220. I saw that God had especially guarded the Bible, yet when copies of it were few, learned men had in some instances changed the words, thinking that they were making it more plain when in reality they were mystifying that which was plain by causing it to lean to their established views, which were governed by tradition. But I saw that the Word of God as a whole is a perfect chain, one portion linking into and explaining another. True seekers for truth need not err, for not only is the Word of God plain and simple in declaring the way of life, but the Holy Spirit is given as a guide in understanding the way to life therein revealed very important passage from the spirit of prophecy. She does make it clear that uh, back in the Middle Ages when the copies of the Bible were very few, there were a few changes made by people that were thinking they were making things more clear. But she doesn't dwell on that. Notice that she mentions that but then immediately moves on to the real point of her passage which is this that the Bible can be trusted. It's a perfect chain of truth. One portion links into and explains the other portions. And then she gives the promise, right, that true seekers for truth need not be mistaken. We need not err, for um, the Word of God is plain and simple in declaring the way of life. And the Holy Spirit is given as a guide in understanding the way to life therein revealed. The purpose, the point, the focus of this paragraph is to build our faith in the Word of God, not to tear it down and destroy it. So let's draw some conclusions here. The context of this statement is the false teaching of eternal torment in hell. I haven't read those passages because we don't have time, but if you go yourself, look up early writings, uh, it's page 220, and you will see that the context of this statement is very clearly in the context of eternal, the idea of eternal torment in hell. She is fighting against that idea and she makes this statement that there are some Bible verses that uh, people changed trying to clarify their idea of an eternal torment in hell when actually they confused what the Bible was actually teaching. Now, 
If you know the Bible, you might be able to think of a couple of passages that might fit in that category that refer to things such as eternal torment or the smoke of their burning ascendeth forever, something like that. But it's very significant that Ellen White never identifies specific verses that were altered. Now, could she have? Well, presumably God could have shown her the specific passages, and maybe He did show her the exact Bible passages that were changed or altered. Whether He did or didn't, the important thing for us is that she did not write them down. And um, that's important because her biggest burden was not to identify a couple of passages that had been changed. Her biggest burden, her most important point, was that we regard the entire Word of God as a whole, as a perfect chain of truth. And this, I, 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 I want to make this statement here because many are using this statement from Ellen White that we have just read to destroy people's faith in the Bible as a whole, to actually plant seeds of doubt that every word can be trusted. And that is, it's unfortunate, it's misleading, and whether it's intended or not, it is dishonest. It's a dishonest use of the spirit of prophecy because that passage is intended by the author to build up our faith in the entire Word of God, not to destroy uh, or to cause doubts as to the validity of the Word of God. Although this statement clearly appears within the context of false ideas regarding eternal torment in hell, it is more than interesting also that Ellen White refers to God, the Word of God, and the Holy Spirit. So if you go back and look closely at that passage from Early Writings, page 220, you will see that Ellen White refers to God, that's the Father, she refers to the Word of God, one of the names of the Son of God, and she refers to the Holy Spirit. So what right would I have to take a statement that identifies all three members of the Godhead and use it to try and prove that the Bible's clearest passages revealing the Godhead are false. Once again, this would be inaccurate and misleading. Let's go to another claim uh, in regards to the spirit of prophecy and the Godhead question, and here it is. The Holy Spirit is not mentioned in Patriarchs and Prophets chapter 1, indicating that the Spirit is not part of the Godhead and was not part of God's counsels. Okay, so this refers back to the passage from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 34, that we looked at earlier in our study, where the comparison was being drawn between the Son and the Father. And the focus of that paragraph we saw is that uh, the Son is one in character and in purpose in unity, right, with the Father. That purpose of that paragraph was to show that they were united in their desire to save humanity. But it is true that the Holy Spirit uh, is not explicitly mentioned in that paragraph. Patriarchs and, Pro uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, paragraph 34. So does this mean that the Spirit was not part of the Godhead at that point, or at least was not part of God's counsels? So let's begin uh, our investigation into this claim by looking at another statement Ellen White made. Um, and she says this, The Godhead was stirred with pity for the race. And the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit gave themselves to the working out of the plan of redemption. In order to fully carry out this plan, it was decided that Christ, the only begotten Son of God, should give Himself an offering for sin. What line can measure the depth of this love? So here's a very clear statement uh, referring to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Godhead, um, giving themselves for the working out of the plan of redemption. Uh, it implies very strongly that a conference, right, a council is held, that it is decided that they will give themselves in order to save humanity. This statement provides a definition of the Godhead. It's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This statement reveals that all three members of the Godhead were involved in planning the work of salvation. This statement reveals that all three members of the Godhead were present when the plan of salvation was put into effect. And this statement reveals that all three members of the Godhead gave themselves or self-sacrificed for the salvation of man. It reinforces this idea that God is one, right? A collective, a compound unity. Three individual beings, but the same in purpose, the same in character, the same in, in action, 
in their efforts to save humanity. Now, about the Holy Spirit, the Bible tells us this in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit, talking about the thoughts of God's, of God, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. So, uh, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit is part of the counsels of God. Uh, he understands the mind, the thoughts, the, um, the, the, the purposes of God better than any other being in the universe. And so, again, by implication, the Holy Spirit clearly would have been part of that first council uh, that happened after Adam and Eve sinned. Now, Jesus said about the Holy Spirit's work in John 16, verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And then Jesus says in the next verse, uh, he reveals what the work of the Holy Spirit is. When He has come, He will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So here are three very important things that the Holy Spirit does in the work of salvation. He convicts us of sin. Uh, we call this conscience, right? You do or say something that is wrong, that you know you shouldn't be thinking about or saying. You get convicted of sin. That is the Holy Spirit at work. The Holy Spirit also convicts us of righteousness. Uh, you see somebody in need of help, right? Uh, you're convicted, I need to go do something to help them, or I need to say this. That's the Holy Spirit at work convicting you of righteousness. And then Jesus said that the Holy Spirit also uh, convicts of judgment. That's basically the difference between sin and righteousness, recognizing the difference between good and evil, right and wrong. And the Holy Spirit is involved in that as well. Now, remember those three works of the Holy Spirit because I want to read another passage for you now from the Great Controversy, page 495. This passage is talking about the fall of Lucifer when he finally uh, rebels completely against God in heaven. Read it carefully and you will see all three workings of the Holy Spirit at play here in Lucifer's final decision. Lucifer himself did not at first see whither he was drifting. He did not understand the real nature of his feelings. But as his dissatisfaction was proved to be without cause, Lucifer was convinced that he was in the wrong, that the divine claims were just, and that he ought to acknowledge them as such before all heaven. Fascinating passage here. The Holy Spirit is at work in Lucifer's heart. Lucifer was convinced that he was in the wrong. He's being convicted of sin. That's a work of the Holy Spirit. Lucifer was convinced that the divine claims were just. He was being convicted of righteousness. That's a work of the Holy Spirit. And Lucifer was convinced that he ought to acknowledge the divine claims as such before all heaven. That is being convicted of judgment, the difference between right and wrong. Lucifer, or, or the Holy Spirit, was working on Lucifer to recognize the sin growing in him, what he should do, what truth was, and then what to do about it. And when Lucifer turned his back on the Holy Spirit's efforts to pull him from this pit of sin, there was nothing more that God could do for him. But here's the point. We see here from uh, Great Controversy that the Holy Spirit clearly is at work doing the same things back then at Lucifer's fall as Jesus said he is doing today. And so it's really without warrant to say that the Holy Spirit wasn't in existence at the time of the council between the Father and the Son, or that he wasn't part of the, the effort to save humanity, uh, Lucifer fell before this council between, Adam and e uh, between God the Father and God the Son after Adam and Eve fell. And the Holy Spirit was part of that work to, to save Lucifer. So it's really without warrant to suggest that the Holy Spirit somehow was not part of God's plan and um, execution of that plan to save humanity. Now we're going to move to the third and final area of our study, and that is the devil's attack against our understanding of history. How we understand and use history is incredibly important. And as I mentioned at the beginning of our study, we're seeing this in the broader culture today. History books are being rewritten. Uh, a lot of folks don't even care what history is, and we are often being told that what you were taught about history is completely wrong. Here's what actually happened. 
why is this taking place? Well, the devil knows that if he can get a nation or a society to become uh, unhinged from its history, he can lead them in whatever direction he wishes. And the same is true in the religious and spiritual realms. If the devil can disconnect a church or a people from its history, then he can lead us or lead them wherever he wishes. And so let's uh, take a look at some of the claims that uh, deal more with historical issues in regards to the Godhead controversy. Here's the first one. The doctrine of a trinity is taught by the Roman Catholic Church and therefore must be rejected. Now, it is true that many things the Roman Catholic Church teaches are not true. And it is true that many of those things should be rejected. But the real question is, why are they untrue and why should they be rejected? Are they untrue simply because another church teaches them? Should they be rejected simply because uh, another church says this is so? Or should they be rejected because they disagree with the Bible? And uh, I hope the answer is obvious to you, right? Something is not true because it disagrees with the Bible. Something should be rejected because it doesn't agree with the Bible, not because somebody else might happen to believe it. Let me give you a few quick examples maybe to help illustrate this point. Mithraism, which was an ancient pagan cult in, in, in ancient Rome. Mithraism practiced a form of baptism in the blood of a bull. Those that would be baptized walked under a metal grate. A bull was placed on top. Its, its throat was slit. And as the blood dropped down through the gate, it would drip onto the people and they would be baptized. Now, that's gory. It's gross. It's completely distorted from what the Bible says about baptism. But does that mean that we should just throw out the idea of baptism at all simply because some people had a mistaken idea of it? Clearly not. Uh, the ancient Greeks believed that Hercules was born in a type of incarnation. Now, if you look at what they believed about this Hercules, it's very different from what the Bible teaches about Jesus Christ. Hercules reflected uh, much of the worst aspects of human nature, uh, clearly very different from what the Bible says about Jesus. But does this mean that we should just discard the idea altogether of an incarnation? Clearly not. Hindus believe in avatars, another dim shadow of the incarnation. Should we throw it out because Hindus have uh, some kind of idea about incarnation? Of course not. Many pagan religions have practiced animal sacrifices. Do we throw out what the Bible says about animal sacrifices just because pagan religions have a form of it as well? Or what about the final judgment? Uh, Islam teaches about a final judgment. Does this mean that I throw out every passage of Scripture that talks about a judgment <clears throat> or a final judgment just because Muslims believe in a final judgment? Of course not. I could give other examples, but I think you get the point that something is false not because somebody else might happen to believe some form of it. It's false because it doesn't agree with the Bible. Um, an idea should be rejected not because the Roman Catholic Church might happen to teach that idea. It should be rejected if it doesn't agree with the Bible. And what we're actually doing by making a claim like this, that um, <clears throat> the idea of the Trinity should be rejected because the Catholic Church teaches it, we're really placing the Church above the Bible, which is exactly one of their claims. And uh, if you want to distance yourself from Roman Catholicism, then don't treat the Bible the same way they do. Let the Bible be the final authority. Now, what does the Catholic Church actually teach about the Trinity? We'll get it straight from them. This is from the Catholic Encyclopedia in the article under the Trinity. In this Trinity of persons, the Son is begotten of the Father by an eternal generation, and the Holy Spirit proceeds by an eternal procession from the Father and the Son. Uh, at the end of the statement, <clears throat> they make it clear that uh, their view on the Trinity is very important to them. Um, this, the church teaches, is the revelation regarding God's nature, which Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came upon earth to deliver to the world, and which she proposes to man as the foundation of her whole dogmatic system. So, their view of God is very important, and it is absolutely central to their dogmatic system. Uh, now, we're going to come back to that point in just a moment here, and we'll see why it is so, why their view of the nature of God and their view of how the Trinity is structured uh, lies 
at the foundation of how they do church. That'll become clear in just a moment. But first, let's look at uh, this chart, which came from the website theheavenlytrio.com, and it's comparing the Catholic with the non-Trinitarian um, with the biblical view uh, of the, uh, the, the Trinity. So on the left side, you see the Catholic view. The capital F stands for Father, the S stands for Son, the HS stands for the Holy Spirit. And they view the Father as the source and then the Son um, coming off from the Father with that uh, eternal begetting of some sort. And then the Holy Spirit is an eternal procession from both the Father and the Son. So this is an attempt here with the curved arrows to represent that. Um, but in the Catholic view, it's really just one being that is being expressed in three persons. This is very different from the biblical and spirit of prophecy view of three distinct beings, but we'll get to that. So one being uh, expressed in three manifestations or three persons, and um, this one being is God. Now, in the non-Trinitarian view, or at least a common version of it, you again have the Father as the source, the Son um, emanating or being begotten from the Father at some point in the distant past. This is actually not so different from the Catholic view. And then in the non-Trinitarian view, the Holy Spirit is uh, either the Spirit of the Father or the Spirit of the Father and the Son. And again, it's actually quite similar to the Roman Catholic view of the Holy Spirit with an eternal procession coming from the Father and the Son. So in the non-Trinitarian view then, you have really two beings that make up God. You have the Father and the Son, and then the Spirit is just the Spirit of both of them. Now let's contrast that with the third um, column on the right, which is the heavenly trio. And this is the biblical and spirit of prophecy way of looking at the Godhead. You have the Father, you have the Son, you have the Holy Spirit. They are each individual <coughs> entities, uh, but they are united in character, in purpose, and in action. So in this view, there are three distinct beings that are united together to form a single Godhead. You can notice that the two ideas that are more similar are actually the Catholic and non-Trinitarian views. They are both actually opposed to the biblical and spirit of prophecy based view of three distinct beings that are united together in that compound unity to make up a three-part Godhead. Now, <clears throat> the Bible tells us that as individual believers, we have direct communication with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So Jesus said when he was explaining to his disciples how to pray that we can pray to the Father. In fact, that we should pray to the Father. In that model prayer, he said, you know, when you pray, begin, our Father which art in heaven. So we can pray directly to the Father. That's important. That's what Jesus says. We're also told that when we pray, Jesus becomes involved in that prayer. In Romans chapter 8, there is a beautiful passage where Jesus is represented as an angel standing in front of the altar of incense in heaven. And what he does there is, is a beautiful picture. Revelation chapter 8, verse 3. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which is before the throne. So when we pray, our prayers ascend to Jesus Christ, who is our high priest, there in front of God's throne. And what does he do with our prayers? Verse 4 tells us, And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. So Jesus takes our prayers and he mixes it with his own faith, he mixes it with his own righteousness, and then he presents it to the Father. So Jesus Christ intercedes for us individually. That's what the Bible says. And then finally, we are also told that the Holy Spirit dwells in each of us individually. The Bible tells us that uh, we, our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And I want you to notice the individual connection that the Bible says that we are to have with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, that brings up a question. What is the purpose of the church? The yellow box on the screen now represents the church, right? It's the community of believers. 
what is the purpose? Is the purpose of the church to allow you to have a connection with the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit? Well, no. That connection is there first. Um, it is granted to us directly because of the atonement and the work of Christ. So what is the purpose of the church? Well, biblically, the purpose of the church is to organize the believers for mission so that the church can more effectively share the good news of the gospel and um, accomplish the work that God has for it in the world. Now, I want you to compare this view of the church and this view of the church flows from this view of the Godhead, that there are three distinct beings, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This view of the Godhead, the biblical view, has direct implications for how we do church. And now we're going to compare that with the Roman Catholic view of the Godhead. The Roman Catholic view of everything is hierarchical. We saw this hinted at in the chart a moment ago, where you have the Father first as the source, and then the Son comes from the Father, and then the Holy Spirit comes from the Father and the Son. That hierarchy continues in the Roman Catholic system. So you would have angels, you would have Mary, you would have the saints next in position in this hierarchy, and then you come to the human beings, right? You have the Pope at the head of the church, you have the bishops, the other church positions like cardinals, and then you have the local priests, and then you have the individual believers which constitute the church. And then beneath that you have the rest of the world. But it's a very vertical, a very hierarchical way of doing church, and it flows from their view of the Godhead. Now that's exactly what the Roman Catholic Encyclopedia said, that this view of the nature of God forms the foundation of its entire dogmatic system. Now here's what that means. What is the purpose of the church in this view, this hierarchical view of things? Well, the church would include, of course, all the earthly components of this hierarchy. It's the pope, the bishops, the priest, and the church. And while the purpose of the church might include mission and organizing believers for mission, the even more important and crucial and foundational role of the church is that of salvation. In other words, you cannot reach up to the Father or the Son uh, you cannot have a connection with them except through the church, through the hierarchy. And so in this view, the church is organized for salvation. And this is where the, the sacraments come from. If you need to confess your sins, you don't just pray to the Father and ask for forgiveness. You go to your priest. And the authority of the priest comes from the Pope and so forth. And you can see that the view of the Godhead or the view of a Trinity makes a big difference in how one organizes and does this thing called church. Here's another claim regarding history. The non-Trinity doctrine is a foundational pillar, principle, or landmark of the Adventist church that should not be moved. So again, there are many uh, websites, there are many videos being produced, there are books and articles being written claiming that the early Advent pioneers were non-Trinitarians Therefore, we should be also. That is a foundational pillar, it is claimed, that uh, we need to get back to. So we need to look closely at this um, issue. Is this indeed a landmark principle? Ellen White wrote in 1905, as she was speaking to the General Conference in Tacoma Park, Washington, she wrote, Those who seek to remove the old landmarks are not holding fast. They are not remembering how they have received and heard. Those who try to bring in theories that would remove the pillars of our faith concerning the sanctuary or concerning the personality of God or of Christ are working as blind men. They are seeking to bring in uncertainties and to set the people of God adrift without an anchor. So this idea of, of uh, prin uh, landmark principles that should not be moved or drifted away from, it was very important to Ellen White. She was very concerned about it. Now I'm going to read from another statement here. This one's longer where she's going to talk more about these landmark principles and then she's going to identify what the landmark principles are in her understanding. In Minneapolis, in Minneapolis, God gave precious gems of truth to His people in new settings. This light from heaven by some was rejected with all the stubbornness the Jews manifested in rejecting Christ. 
and there was much talk about standing by the old landmarks. But there was evidence they knew not what the old landmarks were. There was evidence and there was reasoning from the word that commended itself to the conscience. But the minds of men were fixed, sealed against the entrance of light, because they had decided it was a dangerous error, removing the old landmarks, when it was not moving a peg of the old landmarks, but they had perverted ideas of what constituted the old landmarks. Okay, now the statement continues. We'll read it in just a moment. But I want you to notice that she is referring to the um, General Conference session in 1888 in Minneapolis, where the message of righteousness by faith was rejected by many of the leaders because they erroneously believed that to accept that would be going against the old landmarks or the old principles that had been established. And she's saying they misunderstood what those principles were, therefore they rejected something that was true. So let's keep reading. She's going to begin explaining what the landmarks are. The passing of the time in 1844 was a period of great events, opening to our astonished eyes the cleansing of the sanctuary transpiring in heaven, and having decided relation to God's people upon the earth. Also the first and second angel's messages, and the third, unfurling the banner on which was inscribed the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. One of the landmarks under this message was the temple of God, seen by His truth-loving people in heaven, and the ark containing the law of God. All right, so Ellen White is going through the list, and she's mentioning many things that are landmarks for the Advent movement and the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The first one is the passing of the time in 1844. This is a reference to the 2300-day prophecy in Daniel 8, verse 14. That is a landmark. It is never to be moved. We are never to question or doubt or discard our understanding of that time prophecy or the fact that it ended on October 22, 1844. Also included in the landmarks are the first and second and third angel's messages, the commandments of God, um, the faith of Jesus, the law of God. All of these are landmarks which are never to be moved. Now, she continues, The light of the Sabbath of the fourth commandment flashed its strong rays in the pathway of the transgressors of God's law. So the Sabbath is a landmark. It is never to be moved. The non-immortality of the wicked is an old landmark. I can call to mind nothing more that can come under the head of the old landmarks. All this cry about changing the old landmarks is all imaginary. Now, she's again writing in reference to the message of righteousness by faith, but again, people were rejecting that message because they assumed that it went against an old landmark. So she took the time to write out, here is what the old landmarks are that should never be moved. She never says anything about the Godhead or Trinity issue, one way or the other. And uh, we could spend a lot of time surmising why she doesn't mention that in either direction, but the simple fact is she does not mention it among the old landmarks. So, to get some clarity on the issue, we need to look more carefully at what were the Adventist pioneers actually standing against when they rejected the, uh, the Trinity idea, or at least the popular Trinity idea. So let's look at a few of their writings. Joseph Bates wrote in 1868, Respecting the Trinity, I concluded that it was an impossibility for me to believe that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, was also the Almighty God, the Father, one and the same being. So he's rejecting the idea that the Father and the Son are actually the same being, but manifested in different ways. That is the Catholic view. And we saw that it's actually very similar to the anti-Trinitarian view as well. Bates rejected that idea. He believed that the Father and the Son are distinct, separate beings. Now, we'll look at some other statements. This was by A.C. Bordeaux, writing in 1869. And he's explaining what he is against. That God is an infinite and eternal spirit without person, body, shape, or parts, right? So he, along with the other Adventist pioneers, believed that uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are unique uh, individual beings that, in some sense, they have a body, right? They have uh, personality, individuality. He's rejecting this mystical idea that God is just a spirit without person, body, shape, or parts. Reading on, 
He also rejected this idea that Jesus Christ is God Himself, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are one identical being. So again, he's rejecting the Catholic view of the Trinity, that the members of the Trinity are one being just manifested in different ways. What about J.N. Loughborough? This is from a statement in 1861. He wrote, If Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost are each God, it would be three gods, for three times one is not one, but three. There is a sense in which they are one, but not one person as claimed by Trinitarians. So again, he is uh, against the Roman Catholic Trinitarian view of one God, um, one being that is manifested in multiple entities. Uriah Smith had a similar view. He wrote the doctrine called the Trinity, claiming that God is without form or parts, that the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are three, are, the three are one person. Like the other early pioneers, Uriah Smith rejected this Catholic idea of the Trinity. J. H. Wagoner wrote, Is Christ the Father in the Trinity? If so, how is He the Son? Or if He is both Father and Son, how can there be a Trinity? Wagoner, like the others, believed in a separate, distinct, uh, three separate distinct uh, beings or people that made up the Godhead. D. M. Canwright wrote, Every argument of the Trinitarian to prove three gods in one person contradicts reason and contradicts the Bible. R. F. Cottrell wrote in 1869, That one person is three persons, and that three persons are only one person, is the doctrine which we claim is contrary to reason and common sense. Again, it's the Roman Catholic version of the Trinity that they are fighting against, not the idea of a Father and a Son and a Holy Spirit that are co-eternal, co-existent, um, that together make up the Godhead. D.W. Hole wrote, We don't believe that Christ is the very and eternal God and at the same time very man, that the human part was the Son and the divine part was the Father. We might here add that the orthodox view of God as expressed by them in several articles of faith is that God is without body, parts, passions, center, circumference, or locality. Again, it's a mystical view of God that is being rejected. So we have looked today at the devil's attempt to pull God's people away from uh, Bible truth, from the spirit of prophecy, and from our understanding of history and what it means for us. He's of course trying to do this in many different ways. We have looked today specifically at, at issues surrounding the Godhead debate. It's an important issue because people are being led to believe that the church is in apostasy, that the church is in error, and that they need to separate from the church in order to have a pure faith. And we need to recognize that the devil is trying to get us to misunderstand and misuse the Bible, the spirit of prophecy, and our understanding of history. We don't want to be misled. You don't want to be misled. That's why you've watched all the way to the end of this video. And so my prayer for you is that you will continue studying, that as you prayerfully study the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, as you seek to understand the, the, uh, the purpose that God has for His church today, that you will be confirmed and affirmed in your faith and that you will not be drawn away and separated from the body of believers that Jesus is calling out to fulfill His mission in the world today. Thank you and God bless in your continued study of His Word.